Would you turn your Bibles or flip on your iPhones to Psalm 34? iPads, yes. And for those of you not elect who have Android devices, that'll work too. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a good mood this week. My wife is back. Psalm 34, I'd like to read for you the entire thing. These are the words of the living God and worthy of your full attention. Please hear them and may those who have ears to hear from the Spirit of God hear what the Lord says. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise is shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him And were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves the length of of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evil evildoers, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let us pray. Oh, Father, how fitting the songs we have just sung as groundwork, as as foundational truths to believe as we lead into this psalm. A psalm where David cries out and commands us and exhorts us to taste and see your goodness. It all starts with the cross. It all starts with the fact that we are new creatures in Christ, that the work you have done is complete, that our standing before you is righteous because Christ is died for our sins, and you've transferred to our account his righteousness, and it's done. And we are new, no matter what the world tells us, no matter what the devil tells us, no matter what our own conscience sometimes tells us in our flesh, we are new creatures in Christ. Now, Father, may your spirit indwell this place, indwell our hearts, that we might truly afresh today comprehend not only with our minds but feel in our heart 
see, as it were, taste, as it were, your goodness. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. How many words do you suppose you will say today? Not as many as I will, probably, right? How many words does a person on average say in a given day? There was a book released not too long ago where this, uh, this author estimated that men use something like 7,000 words every single day. Women, according to this estimation, use 20,000 words a day. Now, I know what some of you ladies are thinking. You're thinking, my husband doesn't use 7,000 words a day, even if you count "uh uh-huh as two words. (laughs) And some of you men are saying, 20,000, that's pretty low on the scale. for some. And we all have different personalities and such. I get that. But on average, somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 words is probably a reasonable estimate for most of us on most days. Think about that. If, it, if we go in the low end of 10,000 words a day, that's 70,000 words a week. Look back over the last week at your 70,000 words. What did you say? What was the majority of the content of your words? Someone listening to you, if we could play back this past week of your expressions, the things that came out of your mouth, what would we learn about you from your words? We can learn a lot. Those are not my, that's not my teaching, that's Jesus' teaching. In fact, we know the Bible is filled with convicting statements, some more than others that make us just go, ooh, that's hard. But I think for me, one of the most challenging is when Jesus said, your mouth speaks what's in your heart. Out of the heart, Jesus says, the mouth speaks. What you say can tell you what's going on in here. If you are a person filled with bitterness and anger and resentment, it's going to come out in what you say. Because your words will be words of bitterness, anger, and resentment. If you walk in fear, if you walk in hopeless desperation, what's going to come out? are words of fear, where you're terrified, you are despairing, you don't see any good thing around the corner. If, on the other hand, your heart is filled with joy and gladness, it's going to come out. You're going to laugh. You're going to sing. You're going to encourage others. If your heart is full of love, what comes out of your mouth are going to be things that build others up. If there's substance in your heart, there'll be substance in your words. If there's frivolity and and triviality in your heart, there will be nonsense and humor alone coming out of your mouth. What fills your mouth? David said, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. This is what I'm going to say. Of my 70,000 words a week, I'm going to fill my mouth repeatedly, day after day, voice after voice, speech after speech, speech with his praise. Because his soul is boasting in the Lord. It starts on the inside. Anybody can fool somebody for a while. We We can control our tongue for a period of time. And we can say things that we don't really mean and we can keep things in. But eventually what's in there is going to come out. If your soul is boasting in the Lord, then what is going to come out of you is praise and honor to the Lord. David says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this at all times. I will bless the Lord. I will praise the Lord. I will honor the Lord at all times. Now we hear somebody say this and we're tempted to think, Yeah, but David had a lot of good things going for him. He was the king of Israel. He had servants waiting on his every need. He had all the joys and pleasures and delights that he could could handle. He had favor from the Lord continually. Sometimes we think that. And until he went and messed it all up by committing some major sins, life was good for David. 
And of course, when we're feeling good, when life is good, it's easy to say, I will bless the Lord. I will praise the Lord all the time. His praise will be my mouth all the time. Hey, this is a good day. I feel good. My wife is back. I'm feeling good. I will rejoice. But did you notice what prefaces this psalm? Look at the very top. Most of your translations will have something about what the setting of this psalm. A psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech who drove him away and departed. Do you remember this scene? It starts off in 1 Samuel chapter 20 where David comes to Jonathan. He says, what have I done? What sin have I committed against your father, the king? This obviously is when Saul was king of Israel before David was. What have I done to deserve your father's treatment? He's trying to kill me. Jonathan said, no, no, he's not trying to kill you. My dad tells me everything. I would know it if he were after you. And they set up this little test. David said, you go ask him this. I'm not going to show up for dinner tomorrow. And you find out if he responds this way, it'll indicate everything's fine. If he responds this way, if he's angry that I'm not there, it'll prove he's angry with me and he's trying to kill me. And Jonathan shows up. David doesn't. Two days in a row. And Saul gets livid. Where is David? And Jonathan says what David told him to say. And Saul picks up a spear and throws it at his own son trying to kill Jonathan because he's so angry at David. And Jonathan is taken back. Whoa. My father really does want David's head. And they set up another signal where David's waiting out in a field and he says, wherever I shoot this arrow and whatever I yell to my servant, one way or the other, that'll be my signal to you whether you're right. And the signal was, yes, run for your life, David, my father wants to kill you. So David flees. He runs to a, a priest. And the only bread that is there is the consecrated bread. And David says, give it to me. I'm starving. I need that. He says, I need a sword. And the priest says, well, there's only one sword here. It happens to be that one you used to kill Goliath. David says, that's a great sword. There's no other like it. Give it to me. And he runs from that place, and he runs to Gath, where Achish was the king. And he tries to kind of sneak in subtly, but they all know he, who he is. They know his reputation, and they cry out to the king and say, Isn't this the one of whom they sang? Saul killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. This is a mighty warrior, and suddenly David can't be incognito any longer. And you know what he does? He acts literally insane. He goes to the city gates and he flails around on the ground and he scribbles on the gate posts and he lets saliva come pouring out of his mouth and he acts like he is stark raving mad. And they drag him in before the king and he's flailing around and he's acting like he's insane <laughs> and the king says a great thing, he says, do I not have enough crazy people in my presence that you need to bring me one more? What is this? Get him out of here. And David runs and escapes that, and he goes to the cave of Adullam alone, not knowing what's coming next. He's on the run for being innocent, for being God's favored one, for seeking to please the Lord. This is David. Do you remember when he killed Goliath? He shows up and the entire army of Israel is scared to death to face this giant of a man, this Philistine. And David shows up, a little guy. He's pretty. The Bible says he's handsome. He's the quintessential pretty boy who's small in stature. He's just got, you know, got a great smile and he comes walking up and he can't believe all these big, powerful, strong, mighty men are afraid to fight Goliath. Certainly Goliath was way bigger than any of them. That's not the point. He could not believe that these were the people of God cowering before this pagan man. He says, we have the Lord on our side. I'll take him. Goes out there with his sling, throws the one, you know, sling around it, around. Come on, everybody sling. And I'm kidding. And one stone flying through the air hits Goliath. He falls to the ground. He takes his sword and he cuts off this giant's head because he trusted the Lord. And what does he get for his faithfulness? 
The king of Israel wants him dead, runs him out of town, chases him into a cave all alone. And it's in that context that David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will boast in the Lord. This is not the writing of a man who everything is going his way. This is a man who had, humanly speaking, the right to say, what's going on here? Things are not going my way. I will boast in the Lord. Have you ever been asked to give your testimony? Have you been in a situation where someone says, would you share your testimony at a church service or a meeting or a gathering? You know, there's something amiss about the phrasing of that question. Would you share your testimony? Here's the testimony you have because it's the same one that I have. I am a horrible sinner. That's my testimony. That's really the only boasting I have any right to say is, I'm an ugly ugly, sinful man. It's not really our testimony that we should ever give, you know? We should rephrase that. When somebody asks us that, we should say, I won't give my testimony, but I'll give the Lord's testimony. Have you been in those situations where you hear someone sharing their story, and by the end, what you're doing is you're leaving thinking about that person? Or you think, that person, that guy's really full of himself. He really is boasting in himself. He throws a little Jesus in there along the way, but it's really all about him. David says, my boast is in the Lord. I will tell you of my sin, but more so I will magnify the grace and the power and the glory of God. I will boast in him and only in him. How many of you know who Philip Humber is? Nobody? I see one hand back there. Anybody else? Did you know about him before yesterday? No. See? Philip Humber did something yesterday that only 20 people had done in all of human history that we know of. He pitched a perfect game in baseball. He's a Chicago White Sox pitcher. The 21st perfect game ever thrown. He was, an, he was nobody before then, and for most of you, he's a nobody even today. <laughs> but he's going to have some, like his jersey and his gloves and stuff, it's all going to end up in the Hall of Fame for baseball in Cooperstown, New York, because he threw a perfect game. For those of you that don't have a clue what that means, it means nobody on the opposing team reached base the entire game. They had 27 batters, 27 batters got out. That's a perfect game. It's only happened 21 times in the history of Major League Baseball. I watched about a 10-minute interview with him yesterday after the game. He couldn't stand talking about himself. He talked about his teammates. He talked about this. But the first thing and every chance he got where it didn't seem like he was being just, you know, kind of a jerk about it, he praised the Lord. He said, for a long time in my career, it was all about me and my stats, and I wanted to prove that my hard work was, was paying off, and I was a miserable pitcher. He said, my hard work hasn't changed. I finally just said, I'm here to please God in whatever he brings, and today he happened to bring a perfect game. He said, he probably won't bring a perfect game the next time I pitch, and that's okay. I'm not doing this to have a perfect game. I'm not doing this to be the best there is. I'm doing this for the glory of God. Of God. I went to his Twitter account, and it says, his little bio on his Twitter account, some of you are going to have to Google Twitter to find out what this is, but <laughs> he says on the bio of his Twitter account, if you're looking for answers, I have none, but Jesus has them. I'm the lover of a beautiful wife and three kids, and I happen to pitch for the Chicago White Sox. It's the last thing on his bio. The first thing is Jesus. And I went through some of his tweets, and many of them are God-honoring, Christ-honoring quotes from the Scripture. Here is a man who has just suddenly been thrust onto the, the, uh, the, the, the podium of world fame, at least American fame in baseball, and he has one boast. I will boast in the Lord. This baseball thing is just a job. It's not that big a deal. 
I will boast in the Lord and his grace and his mercy and his power. And what happens when we do that? What happens when David does this? The humble will hear it and rejoice. Now, the humble he's talking about here are those who are afflicted. They have been humbled by circumstances. And when they hear us boast in ourselves, nothing good comes of that. But when they hear us boast in the Lord, they will rejoice because God is good and he is faithful, and that causes the people of God to rejoice. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us, as a community of humble, afflicted people, let us exalt his name together. Whenever we lift high the name of Jesus Christ, whenever we exalt him, those who are afflicted gather together and say, praise the Lord to God be the glory, great things he has done. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's what happens when we lift up his name in our hard circumstances. Then he begins to tell us why he's praising the Lord. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Did you notice how many times the word fear occurred in the songs we sang today? We didn't plan that, because when we planned the service, I didn't know I was going to preach on Psalm 34 yet. Fear is going to be very important in this psalm. Catch it as we go. He delivered me from all my fears. Then he speaks of the crowd. They looked to him and were radiant. That means they were radiating joy because they were worshiping God. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man... He cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. You can hear this being sung in the crowd. I sought the Lord, and he delivered me. They went to the Lord, and their faces are bright and shining with the glory of God's goodness. This poor man called out to God, and he heard him. All of us praise the Lord in our troubles because the angel of the Lord is always among his people. Always. I will never leave you nor forsake you no matter how dark and difficult life gets. But he had to seek the Lord. We talked about this last week. We have to seek the Lord. The Lord, and it can't be a simple Lord, I need help, and then get about your business. Sometimes people highlight Peter's prayer. You know, Lord, save me. He, 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 the Lord comes walking across the water, and, and Peter says, If that's really you, let me walk on the water too. And, and Peter goes walking out there, and then he realizes, What have I done? I can't do this. And he panics, and he starts sinking, and he cries out one little prayer, Lord, save me. And sometimes we highlight that and say, that's all it takes, just a quick Lord save me. Yeah, if, if you are suddenly drowning, you don't need a five-hour prayer meeting. <laughs> just cry out, Lord save me. But that is not the paradigm the Scripture gives us when we're in distress. As we saw last week in Luke 11, it is to cry out to him incessantly, to knock, 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 ask, 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 seek, seek, seek incessantly, shamelessly, persistently. Lord, I need your help. Rescue me. David did that. He sought the Lord continually in faith, and the Lord answered him. And all of these others looked to him, and the Lord responded, and even this poor man cried to him, and the Lord heard him. That poor man might be David. He might be referring back to himself there. Either way, whether it's him or somebody else, the fact is he cried out to God. He went to God. He didn't go to other sources. He didn't go to any other person or any other concept, and he didn't go through religious motion. Now, we don't have a lot of what other churches would call liturgy here. We don't have sacraments, per se. We don't have a lot of of somber rituals. But even in a church like ours, 
who does not have high liturgy, it is easy for us to seek the things of religion rather than the Lord. When we're distressed and afflicted, when we're in the cave alone, sometimes we think, well, I've got to make extra sure I don't miss church. Or, not sure if I want to go to a small group tonight or not, but you know what? I'm really down, so I'd better go. Or I'm going to spend an hour in prayer every day this week. Or I'm going to memorize the book of Philippians. And we can sometimes trade all of those good things as if they were the Lord himself, and they are not. This is the word of God. This is not God. These are the people of God. We are not God. You've got to seek the Lord. Now you go to him through his word and through prayer and among his people for sure, but you must seek the Lord, not your religious practices, no matter how important they are. David did not seek the Bible. He did not seek prayer. I hear us say, and I say this sometimes too, and we're kind of careless in our words, but I hear people talking about the power of prayer. There is no power in prayer. Zero. The only power is God. Prayer is a conversation. We talk to God because he has all power. When we're down, when we're distraught, when we're afflicted, we have to seek him. Our heart has to cry out to him. He is a living person. He's not a concept. He's not the force. He's not a religion. He's a person who bears all the aspects of personality. And he hears and he responds. That is what we must do if we are going to find relief. So after giving his testimony in verse 8, he issues the charge, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Do you hear all the things said about God? He is good. He is good. How is he good? These are all in parallel. We can take refuge in him. When we're scared, we can run to him and find protection. He gives what we need. We have nothing that we want. That doesn't mean we don't want anything. I want a lot of things. He doesn't promise to give me everything I want. He says, I shall not be in want. That's an old way of saying he will provide all of my needs. I won't lack any good thing. And the the whole context here is refuge when we're suffering affliction, when we're running for our lives, or at least it feels like that. We run to him. Imagine if you were concerned, you'd heard reports that there are thieves, armed thieves running through the neighborhoods, and your house may be next. You might be afraid. There's reason for that, right? Right? But if you knew there were a hundred armed policemen covering your house, top to bottom, inside, not everywhere, you would probably rest fairly securely because you have refuge, you have protection, you have someone there stronger and more powerful than your opponent. Our refuge is the living God. What is there to fear? Run to him. He is good, and all who run to him are blessed. These are the things we must do to experience the blessing. Taste the Lord's goodness. That's your part. That's my part. God is objectively good. He is a refuge. He longs to bless his people. He delights to do that. But our part is we have to taste his goodness. Imagine, if you will, a bowl of ice cream. (laughs) And it's got, did you say Snickers? (laughs) A bowl of ice cream. And it's got Reese's peanut butter cups throughout. I tell you, it is a little taste 
of heaven. We will have ice cream and Reese's peanut butter cup in the new earth. It will happen. And it's sitting there on this table for you. And it's good. You're never going to know how good it is if you don't taste it. You have to make a choice to taste it. You have to take the spoon and dip it in and put it to your mouth and taste it. That's what David says, taste that the Lord is good. You have to dare to do it. It's possible it will taste like poison. That's what the kids think every time you want them to try something new, right? Just try it. Oh, I hate that. Have you tried it? No. Then how do you know it's nasty? It just looks nasty. We have to taste it and see. We have to open our eyes and choose to see that the Lord is good. Now, this is hard when we feel like we're running for our lives. To stop our running and dip the spoon in the bowl and choose in the midst of our fear to taste his goodness and choose to open our eyes to see his goodness. As long as we have our eyes and our thoughts and our concentration on the thing of which we are afraid, we won't stop and taste and see the Lord is good. We have to stop running and see his goodness. We have to choose to take refuge in him. He said, how blessed is the man who does this, but the only way we're going to receive the blessing is if we take refuge in him, not in anything else, certainly not in ourselves, but in him. When we stop and take our refuge in him, when we look to him for protection and provision, he will bless us. He promises. And when God makes a promise... He keeps it. We have to fear him. We'll come back to that in a moment. We have to seek him. They who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. That's an active, aggressive, persistent word, just like seek and you shall find. We have to seek the Lord and keep seeking him and keep running to him if we're going to have our needs provided as he says. Notice the comparison with the young lions. Lions are the king of the jungle. They get what they want out there. And the young lions are fast. They are quick. They get what they want usually. But David says sometimes even the young lions don't get everything they need. They get hungry because they can't find any food. But if you seek the Lord, every need will be met. All of them. How do we do that? How do we fear the Lord? He says, come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life? Who is the one who loves days that he may see good? In other words, who is this one who wants God's blessing? Here's what he says. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Interesting. The fear of the Lord. Just that phrase, you know that phrase, you've heard that phrase. Your mind probably goes to the Proverbs, right? The beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge is fear of the Lord. And we think... I'm supposed to be afraid of God? That's how I get smart? Well, no, no, no. We we, we say, no, it doesn't really mean be afraid of him. It means respect him, honor him, revere him. And there's truth to that. But the writer of the Proverbs did not leave us unsure of what it means to fear the Lord. Proverbs 8.13 says this. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. This is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Hate evil. Why? Pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverted mouth, God says, I hate. I hate pride, God says. 
I hate somebody who boasts in themselves. I hate arrogance, someone who thinks they're really the stuff. I hate the evil way, and I hate a mouth that speaks things that are not true. That's the fear of the Lord, according to the Scripture. It starts there. David says, I'll tell you how to fear the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil, do good. Seek peace and pursue it. I was thinking about this week. What do we do when we're afraid? Part of it is we run and, and such. We go find our own cave and try to escape. But, but think about it. We, we have this term that we call insecurity. What is insecurity? It means I'm not secure. I'm afraid. The foundation underneath me may not be solid. I'm afraid I'm going to fall. When we're insecure in relationships, for instance, when we are fearful in front of someone, we do a lot of things to deflect, but one of the things that we often do, especially if the reason that we are afraid is we think that they are judging us or we feel judged by them or we think they're superior or we're feeling self-conscious because we have failed in something, one of the things we do is we turn on them with our mouths. We speak evil against them. We go out and tell others bad things. All the while, it's our own fear that is driving this. Have you ever had somebody lie about you, slander you to others because inside they're really afraid? Maybe you expose their sin somehow. Maybe this is just the reaction. They're doing this to everybody because they're walking through life in fear and the way they're defending themselves is to attack everybody else. This has happened to me. It's happened to us collectively. People who are afraid, who are insecure, and that provokes anger, and they go and they tell lies about us. That's not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord says, I don't want to do what is evil because God hates evil. I want to do what is good. I'm going to keep my mouth pure because I fear God because I love God, because I want to honor God. I'm going to depart from the evil and do good. I'm going to seek peace. That's not peace with God. That's peace with each other. I'm going to seek peace. I'm going to pursue peace. I'm going to use my mouth to say things that will bring reconciliation and brotherhood. I'm not going to say things that are going to hold people far off. Now, don't miss the connection. What fills your mouth? Is your mouth filled with praise to God and reconciling words with your brothers and sisters? Or is your mouth filled with evil and hate and separation? You can't expect ever God to bless you if you're pursuing evil. In other words, you're not going to feel God's protection. You're not going to feel that he will take care of you if you are in unrepentant sin. You're going to feel guilty because you are guilty and you know better. We have to abandon our sin and pursue righteousness and peace if we're going to sense God's favor upon us when we're afraid. If fear makes us turn against people and pursue evil, then we're not. There's no way you're ever going to feel good, feel like God's joy is poured out upon you because you know you're pursuing the very thing he hates. But we do this in our flesh, and our weakness. When fear comes, when afflictions come, when trials come, we tend to turn to sinful things rather than to God and righteousness. I talk to people, you talk to people who they don't understand why God's not changing. Why isn't he shining his face upon them? Why are they not the kind of person who's now walking out of their, their quest for God and, and, and beaming with his joy? All the while, they're holding grudges and bitterness against others. Or they're lashing out at their spouse or their kids. 
or they're, they're looking at their, their owners, the, the, the owners of the, the business, their bosses or, or neighbors or their parents or somebody as, as evil people that are their enemies. And they wonder why they're not feeling the joy of the Lord. It's because God hates those things. It's only when we turn and pursue what is right and good in his eyes that we will receive his blessing and feel his blessing and sense his blessing and walk in joy. He says that in the next verse, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Now, if you've been in Dwight's class the last few weeks, It has been a wonderful class. If you haven't, listen to it online. He has been going through the glorious doctrine, really, of the gospel, what we call justification by faith. The point is, your standing before the Lord eternally is not dependent on anything you do, but only on what Christ has done. If you try to approach God in your own righteousness at all, you will be condemned because your righteousness is not righteous. Our eternal destiny hangs on the truth of that doctrine and our belief in Christ. This is not contradicting that. The scripture often uses the word righteous for God's people. People who have faith in what God has promised and are striving to please him because they have already received his righteousness. He's not saying the eyes of the Lord are toward those who are inherently perfectly obedient. That's not the point. He's talking about people who believe God's promises in faith, who receive his justification, and now love him and want to please him. The Bible repeatedly calls us righteous. He calls, it calls us saints. That's who he's talking about. And those who are his and pursuing righteousness because of their love for him, his eyes are toward them and his ears are open to their cry. But even the righteous ones, when we're pursuing evil, are not going to receive God's blessing other than the blessing of repentance. He will finally stop us and turn us around, but he's not going to pour out great things on us. He's not going to give us in our hearts the joy we long to experience if we are incessantly pursuing evil. Verse 17, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their trouble. So let me recap. What we're saying here is the person who is afflicted, who is oppressed, who's who's feeling persecution, and he cries out to the Lord, and he strives to use his mouth for good things, and he seeks reconciliation and peace with others, and he is desiring not to disobey God, but to obey God in the midst of his affliction. God says, I will hear your cry. He is close. He delivers them out of all their troubles. Verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. What does that remind you of? Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are crushed and weighed down and afflicted, blessed are they. Now, you don't get to heaven because you have a string of bad luck. That's not his point. If you are crushed and brokenhearted and don't know how you're going to make it through today except you cast your eyes and all your anxieties on Christ and you trust him and you are pursuing righteousness because you love him, Jesus says, Those are the people who will receive the kingdom. Because the Lord is near to those people. He draws near when we are oppressed and afflicted. He comes alongside us. His angel is always encamped around us, but he has a tender place for us when we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. Verse 19 is probably a a sentence, a verse that we need to plaster on our walls and our bathroom mirrors and our shower walls and our rear view mirrors and our wallpapers on our 
electronic devices. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Did you hear that? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. You've heard the book, you've heard people say this. Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, if you're talking to an unbeliever, there's only one really good answer to come back. is to say you're asking the wrong question. The real question is, why do good things ever happen to bad people? Because we are all sinners, we all deserve nothing but God's wrath and rejection. The fact that he would be good to anybody, the fact that you are still here breathing should boggle your mind. Why would God, a holy and just God, allow me to stay alive for another second? That's the question. But if we're talking to believers, if we're talking about the saints, sometimes we do ask the question, why, Lord, this person, from my perspective, seems to be pleasing you and serving you and and striving. He's He's not in disobedience. He's not calling out and questioning you like Job. Why are you pouring out such hard things for him? And the answer is right here. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Beyond that, don't ask. God has never chosen to reveal to us why he picks some people to suffer especially grievous things and other people less grievous things. And it's, he doesn't have to answer that question. He's God. And we, we need to not try too hard to defend God's integrity here. If he doesn't decide to defend his integrity, why should we? The truth of the matter is, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. How many? Don't know. But if you're his, you can be sure difficult times come. It's a promise. But so is the next phrase. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. That's the phrase that sometimes we don't like. And the reason sometimes we don't like it is because we don't like the way he delivers us. We want deliverance from Saul. God, take him out. He didn't have a right to kill me. We want deliverance from whatever it is we feel oppressed by, whether it's our job, our family, relationships, cancer, whatever. We want deliverance from those things. And God says he will deliver us from them all. And he will. But sometimes his deliverance is the ultimate deliverance. I know that because of the very next verse. He keeps all his bones speaking of the righteous, keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. That seems very strange to me. What's that doing here? Well, I may not know what it's doing in this context, but I know what it's doing in this context. Have you heard that verse before? Do you know where it shows up later? John 19, Jesus is on the cross, dead has suffered the wrath of God on behalf of his people. And the soldiers come by to break the legs of the soldiers or of the criminals who are hanging there because they want to hurry up things and cause them more pain. And Jesus is already dead and they don't break his legs. And John refers back to that and says, the scripture says, not a bone of his will be broken. Now think about this. Think about this from the human perspective. Great. So he doesn't break any bones, he just dies of crucifixion. How's that a good thing? God really blessed him, didn't he? Delivered him. I'm sure God or Jesus is saying, whew, at least my legs didn't get broken. What's the point? God did deliver his son after he died. He was required to endure all the way to death 
on a cross, and then God raised him from the dead. And that promise is held out to all of his people. He may not rescue you from cancer or from your present affliction until he rescues you in a redeemed, glorified body in the new heavens and new earth as you sit down to a large bowl of ice cream. He doesn't promise to take you away from every affliction that comes here and now. But in the grand scheme of things, he delivers us beyond our wildest imaginations. Look at the next few verses, next two. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. I'm I'm confident that the reason we struggle with despair and trial as trials come is because we take our eyes off the cross. When your eyes are on the cross and you realize that a man who deserved no affliction took all of your eternal affliction and all of my eternal affliction so that we who may have to go through 20, 30, 40, 80 years of trial and pain can have an eternity of joy and satisfaction. When we take our eyes off of the cross, we forget we deserve condemnation. When this verse, it says, evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. That was us at one point in our lives, every one of us. We stood condemned before God. Now we stand righteous. Today, right now, we are righteous. He has declared it so. We keep our eyes on the cross, on what Jesus has done. We can endure anything God brings to us in this life. The Bible calls them trials. He's trying our faith. He tells us, I will test your faith. I am going to show you whether or not your faith is real. When I bring you through hard times, when I bring you through challenges and afflictions, here's the test. Will you trust me or will you trust yourself or some other human agent? When you are in pain and are afraid and are suffering, will your words fill with bitterness and resentment and anger and hostilities? Or will your mouth be filled with my praise? I'm testing you to see which it is. That's why they're called trials, beloved. And I don't know why he tries, who he tries, when he tries, for how long he tries. That's his business as God. But I do know he calls all of us to have exactly the same response. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually fill my mouth. I will make my boast in the Lord. Always. We can do that because of the cross. He took our condemnation. Can we not take some pain? Yes, we can. If we keep our eyes on him. We focus on him. Brother Jay, would you come and pray for us?